Did you know that it's 150 years to this very day that Lewis Carroll's book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, was first published? This bizarre tale of a girl, unsurprisingly called Alice, meeting a range of crazy creatures is considered the definitive example in the literary nonsense genre. It and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass, have inspired a raft of films, musicals, comics, songs, and, of course, video games. To celebrate the first book's anniversary, I want to look at the latter, and exactly how and why Wonderland has helped to inspire a range of very interesting titles. I'll be looking at two in particular, both called Alice in Wonderland, one for the Game Boy Color, and the other for the Nintendo DS. I've managed to get the input from developers behind both too, and will be quoting them throughout. Let's start with the GBC game then, which was released in 2000 and developed by Digital Eclipse Software and published by Nintendo. Rather bizarrely, it's based around the Disney animated adaptation that was released way back in 1951. So it was a bit like a 50 year anniversary, but not quite. An un-anniversary, if you will. The first thing that strikes you when you play it is just how colourful it is, as well as the top-notch animation that's present throughout. The title's lead designer, Mike Micah, says the latter was something his team focused on in particular too. To fit everything on the cart, we needed to constantly cut corners, which started with colour and detail, but would eventually cut into animation. We prioritised animation above all, because it was a Disney title. As for the game itself, it's a fairly accurate representation of the film on which it's based, which used characters and situations from both books. Like its source material, the pace is constantly changing too, and instead of being a case of sloppy design, Micah says that this was completely intentional. We really strive to deliver the same kind of pace as the movie. If the movie was overly kinetic in motion, it was absolutely alive in imagery so we created a series of breaks to try to capture that, usually before or after a transition to gameplay, so hopping on rocks over a brook served as a way to slow the pace yet look beautiful, then you transition to the descent into the rabbit hole with surreal yet kinetic gameplay, only to calmly bookend it with an animation of Alice drifting slowly to the bottom. The result of this is that you're never quite sure what's coming next, be it a puzzle stage that asks you to shrink in size, or an action segment where you have to stop the Mad Hatter and March Hare from spotting you. A Metal Gear tea party, if you will. It all helps to create a tangible feeling of chaos, with even the most conventional design choice, a main hub where you must complete various tasks for a range of characters, is lent an unpredictable quality by the fact that you have no idea what to do first. It's far from perfect of course, some sections are maddening, and not in an intentional way, but it's a fine demonstration of how Wonderland can help inspire a very good title, even on a machine with limited power. Let's move on to something that's running on a system that's a little more advanced then. Alice in Wonderland on the Nintendo DS. Developed by Etrange Libelou and published by Disney Interactive Studios, its box, perhaps bravely, proclaims the title to be inspired by the 2010 Tim Burton film. As Benjamin Bertrand, the game's producer, explains though, this wasn't really the case. We were mainly inspired by the book. As the movie was still in production during development, we only had a summary of the movie script and some concept art from Disney's animated adaptation. Some critics said we made a more Burton-esque Alice than the movie itself. It's hard to disagree with that conclusion. Unlike the live action film, which is a murky and largely soulless take on Wonderland, this DS tie-in goes in a much more distinctive, cell-shaded direction. There's a range of locations, some amusing animation, and all the characters are given interesting redesigns. Even the script is pretty amusing at times. As for the game itself, it's a puzzle platformer, but one that gives you no direct control of Alice. Instead, you have to guide her in the right direction by swapping between four characters, McTwisp, Absalom, Cheshire, and the Mad Hatter. Everything is controlled via the touchscreen, and although there are occasional issues with this setup, the many combat sections are repetitive beyond belief, it works well when paired with the slower paced puzzle solving. The most interesting thing here though is how the game, like the books, is very carefully structured, but on the surface can occasionally come off as rambling and nonsensical. One of the main ways it does this is how you move across the world, a jigsaw which you can shift around to reach new areas and backtrack to previous locations. This stops things from feeling too linear, 
even though in actuality you're being funnelled down a set path throughout, very much like Alice in the books. Both games are a lot of fun then, but importantly are quite different in terms of pacing and how they depict Wonderland. From the dark tone of American McGee's Alice to the interactive visual novel Heart no Kuni no Alice, the two titles I've looked at here are far from being the only examples of a different approach to Lewis Carroll's universe reaping rewards too. Micah even has an interesting theory on why the books and movies on Wonderland make for such inspirational material. They're so visually striking and absurd, you can create a gameplay rule that has no relation to the books or films, and it fits because the world is built on the unexpected. We had so many liberties with the game because the more absurd the idea, the more natural it felt. Bertrand also points towards the flexibility of the world in allowing his team to be as creative as possible. I think the universe is really the strongest point. When you are in there, you can't really tell if you are crazy or not. Lewis Carroll plays with every law that makes us rational and comfortable, so it's pleasant for us. We can be surprised at any time, because nothing works as expected. In the end then, the answer why Wonderland is such a good fit for games seems to be because of how much the original books play complete havoc with any kind of structural or thematic consistency. After all, many of the greatest titles ever made do the exact same thing, even if they're in ways we simply subconsciously accept, largely as they're established as part of the very language of gaming. One thing is for sure then, if Lewis Carroll, or Charles Lutwidge Dodgson to give him his proper name, was around today, he'd certainly make for an interesting indie developer. Hey thanks for watching, I really do appreciate it, and do consider sharing this video with others if you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank both Mike Micah and Benjamin Bertrand for answering my questions. It was much appreciated. Also, this video wouldn't have really been possible if I hadn't managed to get Alice in Wonderland on the GBC through a trade with YouTuber Sega of my house, and you can check out his channel through the link on the left here. It documents his game hunting exploits in Australia, and is well worth a watch. You can also see my previous video on if horror games can work on portable devices by clicking the link on the right. Thanks again for watching, and I'll hope to see you again soon.